Hello, I'm State Representative Jim Beakey from the 84th House District. Welcome to Ohio in Focus. Hello and welcome to this edition of Ohio in Focus, a program that brings state government to you. I'm your host, Brad Miller. I'm speaking today with State Representative Jim Beakey, who serves the 84th House District, which includes all of Mercer County and parts of Audley's, Dark, and Shelby Counties. Representative, thanks for sitting down with us today. Brad, it's always a privilege to be here. Um, we're going to start talking about Medicaid reform, and on previous episodes we've talked a lot about Medicaid, but it's been mostly at the statewide level. So how about today we'll delve into uh, some of the uh, issues that affect your district pertaining to Medicaid. Um, in talking to constituents, local, official, uh, local officials, um, what sticks out in your mind as being the major concerns in the district? Well, of course, uh, as you know, there are some ongoing hearings and legislation being discussed to address uh, Medicaid in Ohio. And, uh, of course, it's been a, a rapidly growing segment of our budget. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to look at it to see what we can do to make some positive reforms. And as that relates to the discussion back in the 84th District, of uh, Dark, Mercer, Shelby, and Auglaize counties, there's some interesting statistics that have surfaced. Uh, for example, we have uh, about 18,000, between 18 and 19,000 uninsured residents of the district, and yet we have over 27,000 on Medicaid currently. And obviously it's a, a growing number and it's a cost driver. That's current. And of course, there's been a, a big discussion about expansion of Medicaid. So in the district, we have a lot more people on Medicaid than we do uninsured. That's kind of an interesting thing that popped out to me. Uh, and as it relates percentage-wise, 14% of the population of the district is currently on Medicaid. And, that, and now that's nationwide, it's about 16%. So while we have 14% on Medicaid, that's still 2% less than the national average. We have currently 10% of our adults in the 84th district who are uninsured, but nationally it's 16%. So we have some pretty responsible people and we have less people who are uninsured than we do from a nationwide statistic. A big figure that is very important is we have uh, in our hospitals and healthcare, we have $16, 16 million dollars a year last year in uncompensated care and so that's that's those are some numbers that we'd like to to get down and and so what we're doing and hopefully in the reforms that we're working on here is that in the future we can help reduce those numbers so that's 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 what's going on in the 84th district um, again focus mostly on the district but we can take a step back and talk about the entire state as well um, in your mind what would positive Medicaid reform look like what would need to be accomplished well, what we want to do is we want to continue to take care of that population that for whatever reason can't fend for themselves. That to me is the number one purpose of, of Medicaid, as well as helping those who are in a nursing home situation. And the thing that I'd like to focus more on uh, those folks who are in nursing home is, is to c control costs. Uh, the big issue though is we have hundreds of thousands of people on Medicaid in the state who, if given the incentive to take back responsibility for their health care, we can help them become, uh, become ready to get back and perhaps enter the workforce. That's what, what I'd like to see happen in Medicaid. Help those uh, folks who can, with uh, help, become productive in Ohio. Another hot button issue uh, recently has been Common Core, and it seems like uh, the debate has been heating up on these educational standards. Sure. Um, it seems there is always a balance that needs to be met between local control and also complying with state and federal standards. Sure. Um, can you talk about reaching that balance and um, what role each level plays in ensuring education for the kids? Sure. And of course, Common Core has to do with standards. And, 
and the two standards that we're looking at right now are math and English. And I'm happy to report that uh, I would say all schools in West Central Ohio in the 84th House District meet or exceed those goals. And uh, I mean, we have some of the best schools in the state in the 84th House District. So, so we're doing well. But uh, but here's here's what's coming. It's it's absolutely incumbent on the the school officials, boards, and superintendents, and the local citizens to work together to make sure that what we're, what we're teaching in our schools is going to continue the best education as possible. One of the big issues coming down the, the pike that, that nobody has really talked about in, in much detail in the debate and discussions over Common Core is uh, c future curriculum that's going to be entering. And, and so it's incumbent on our people uh, at both the uh, structured educational level and the residents of the school districts to scrutinize very closely coming textbooks and the content of what is going to be taught in the schools in the future to make sure that what we have going on in education is what we is going to be positive to make our 84th district as successful as it is. Uh, and that probably leads into my next question. As it is right now, um, in what ways do you see Common Core affecting the schools in the district, as well as parents, students, teachers, faculty? Well, it, it, it can be very positive, but, but, but vigilance is the key word here on, on everybody's part, from a professional education standpoint, from a parents and citizen standpoint, to make sure that we continue to teach our children the best so that they can be prepared to be very successful no, no matter what a field of endeavor they choose. There was a bill introduced uh, in the legislature earlier that would essentially repeal Common Core. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to take a close look at that? And if so, what's your reaction to it? I, I have had a chance to look at it. And uh, one of the things uh, that I want to look at is to make sure that there's no unintended consequences with the bill in its current form. And, in, and this fall, as the committee process unfolds when we get back in session, uh, there, there may be some changes made to that legislation to make sure that uh, it, it seeks the goal we need. Um, on the topic of education, school is back in session. All the schools in your district um, are back in session. Sure. Um, so it's always a good idea to remind people to uh, be mindful that there are kids, students out and about, as well as increased traffic, high school students, as well as teachers and faculty driving to school, as well as uh, school buses on the road. Um, what would you say about that? Well, uh, obviously, we want to be very, very cognizant of the fact that school is back in session, and that means there's lots of yellow buses on the road, and uh, hauling the kids to school in the morning, and then after school to all the uh, extracurricular activities, and and so on, and uh, especially uh, you know Friday nights uh, in the 84th district, that's football night, and and, w and then of course you've got soccer, and you got volleyball, and you got golf, and I mean there's just all kinds of beyond school times when the buses are on the road, and and it's incumbent that we as citizens uh, are are very watchful of the, those school buses uh, and make sure that those kids stay safe on those buses. You've also mentioned that. Uh the students on the buses themselves also have a responsibility in uh, maintaining safe roads and uh, providing a safe environment for the drivers. Sure, there's no question about it. And uh, you know, there's been a discussion. Uh, I've been around here 21 years, and there's always been a, a discussion about seat belts and safety on buses. And and uh, quite frankly, um, uh, school buses are a whole lot safer than automobiles because first off. Uh, any impact, uh, the, the brunt of the impact is spread over a lot, lot larger area than in passenger cars and so on. So, and besides that, uh, the, um, uh, the, kit, the way those uh, buses are engineered, they're almost like compartments. And, and, and it's, where it's important is for parents to make sure that the children on the buses sit like they should in the seat so that if there is, uh, uh, hopefully never, but if there is uh, some kind of an accident, that the children will have uh, of safety in front of them. And that those, by compartmentalization in the engineering of those buses, that there won't be injuries or, uh, and so on. So uh, it's the real, real key to safety in school buses is for the children to sit in their seats and behave. Doesn't always happen, but we always hope it does. I understand, but mom and dad can help. 
That's right. Um, and we've talked on earlier episodes too about uh, county fairs, and you are a big fan of county fairs. Yes, I am, I, and particularly the food. I <laughs> And there are four. I just love the county fairs. Who doesn't? <laughs> there are four counties in your district, so four county fairs, yes, and you've uh, attended them. Um, and I understand I you uh, have put together a uh, list of some of the top five moments. Well, I do, but but now before I answer that, I want to tell you there's something else I do besides eat at the fair. I also like to pass out questionnaires. I like to know what my my people are thinking. So every year I have a 15 question questionnaire and I, I like people to give me their opinion. What do you think? That helps me better represent them here in Columbus. So I pass out thousands of those at, at the four, four counties that are in the district. And now, plus they get to see you in person. They as well, get to right? see me in person and that, that ought to scare anybody. But <laughs> I, I do have fun. I love people and, and we have a big time. I, I enjoy uh, and I'm particularly a strong uh, supporter of the uh, uh, 4-H and, and FFA and youth programs uh, uh, as it relates to livestock, poultry, and projects and so on. Because the four county fairs in my district are family fairs with the emphasis on the youth. So now top five, uh, no particular order, but uh, Shelby County, which is the first fair, by far and away uh, my top uh, uh, experience there was the the Shelby County Cattleman ribeye steak sandwich. <laughs> it was, it's killer, <laughs> I'll tell you. I, I had a few of those. <laughs> um, All Glaze County, a uh, big highlight is uh, the sales. Uh, the people, um, the citizens and businesses in All Glaze County, they just support the kids unbelievably when they, when they sell their, their, their livestock at the sales. Uh, it's, it's just huge. Uh, Mercer County, of course, with 4-H and FFA projects, uh, I think the biggest thing uh, that I picked up with, you know, when you, when you ever have a group of people together, particularly kids in competition, there's sometimes a lot of drama. And uh, the, the thing I can report this year, uh, at Mercer County Fair, there wasn't a lot of drama in the barn. So that, that was a big highlight. And then, then of course, Dark County, uh, uh, the big highlight was the, the Florida Georgia line uh, folks in, in the grandstand along with the Montgomery Gentry group. Uh, they, they brought in uh, close to 4,500 people for those concerts. They sold them out, and, uh, and, that's, and that's good because uh, that's, that brings people in and uh, the economy in the area and, and so on. The attendance uh, at the Dark County Fair is huge, and frankly, it's been huge at all the fairs this year because of the weather being nice and because people are, are supporting the, the, the agricultural aspect of the 84th District. Now, I gotta tell you that Probably the one highlight that stands out uh, overall is that this year, uh, uh, Brooke Egbert from Auglaise County had the grand champion steer at the Ohio State Fair. And Brad, this is the fourth year in a row that the grand champion steer at the Ohio State Fair has come from Auglaise County. So that's quite an achievement and, and bodes well, speaks well of, of the, the folks in agriculture who are in the cattle business. It adds to that heritage of West Central Ohio. It is, in fact, uh, it accentuates the, the fact that we are the number one agricultural area of the state. We have about a minute left uh, at the end of the program. How about you uh, share with your constituents how they can best reach you here at the State House? Well, by phone, it's area code 614-466-6344. Uh, email rep84 at ohiohouse.gov. You can friend me on Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, and, and we have monthly surveys. As you well know, every month we have a survey and, and we have a good response from that. But that is tinyurl, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L, dot com slash beaky sept, S-E-P-T. Please take time and let me know what you think on the surveys that we have every month. It's just a big help to me as I work for you. Representative, now that I'm hungry for a ribeye sandwich, it's been a pleasure, as always. <laughs> well, you can throw in an Italian sausage, too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, thanks, Brett. We look forward to seeing you again on the next edition of Ohio in Focus, the program that brings state government to you. Thanks for watching. <laughs>